Hello, everyone. My name is Christoph Barnesser, and I'm a senior researcher at the Oster Institute in The Hague, as well as a research fellow with the International Center for Counterterrorism, The Hague, or ICT. On behalf of the Oster Institute, the ICT, and the UN's ombudsperson to the IS, uh, ISIL, Daesh, and Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee, I would like to virtually welcome you to our webinar entitled A Decade of Review, UN's Ombudsperson to the ISIL, Daesh, and Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee. The office of the Ombudsperson was created by the UN Security Council Resolution 1904 of the 17 December 2009, with the purpose of addressing the lack of a due process procedure for those targeted by UN sanctions on the then Al Qaeda list. Now, 10 years later, the office of the Ombudsperson has accepted 91 delisting petitions and completed 83 cases. And of these, three, of these 83 cases, more than 70% have resulted in the removal of the petitioner's name from the list. Now, these are, of course, quite impressive numbers, but let's use this webinar to delve a bit deeper uh, to find out whether the office has succeeded in its mission, uh, what have been some of the successes, but also the challenges of the last 10 years, and what do the next 10 years look like? Now, to discuss these and more questions, we have a stellar panel for you, consisting of the current and the two former ombudspersons, as well as two external experts with great knowledge on this topic. Ms. Aurélie Bertin, an international lawyer, was also on our panel, but she informed me this morning that she unfortunately had to cancel because she has been hospitalized yesterday. She even suggested to do the webinar from a hospital bed, but I have indicated that her health is more important. But of course, we, will, we uh, all wish her a speedy recovery. But I'm extremely grateful for Dr. Gavin Sullivan, who was able to jump in at the very last moment. Now, let me now introduce the panelists in greater detail to you, starting with Mr. Daniel Kipfer-Fasciati. Since the 18th of July, 2018, Mr. Daniel Kipfer-Fasciati is the Ombudsperson to the ISIL, Daesh, and Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee. And before that, he served as a judge at the Criminal Division of the Swiss Federal Criminal Court from 2004 until July 2018, and between 2014 until 2017 as President of the Court. Prior to and during his judicial career, Mr. Kipfer Fasciati worked as an academic in the fields of philosophy and ethics, jurisprudential and economic, and he held diverse lectureships in these fields at the Department of Jurisprudence of Basel University and at the Basel College of Higher Education. The very first ombudsperson from the 14th of July 2010 to the 14th of July 2015 was Ms. Kimberly Prost, who is now a judge at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Early in her career, she worked for the Canadian Department of Justice for 18 years, serving as a prosecutor and appearing before all levels of courts in Canada, including the Supreme Court. She was also a judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, sitting on trial of seven accused of allegations of crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide related to the events at Srebrenica in July 1995. The second ombudsperson, serving from July 2015 to August 2017, was Ms. Catherine marquis uel and she has more than 27 years of experience in the judiciary and in public service, including with the United Nations, in the fields of criminal law, transitional justice, and human rights. Previously a judge in France, Ms. marquis uel served in the same capacity um, with the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo and the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. She was senior legal officer and head of chambers at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and also held legal positions in France Ministry of Foreign Affairs and with the United Nations peacekeeping missions. Uh, then we had Dr. Gavin Sullivan. He's a senior lecturer in law at the University of Kent and a solicitor at the Senior Courts of England and Wales. And his research focuses on the politics of global security law and data infrastructures. He coordinates the Transnational Listing Project, which is a global law clinic that provides pro bono representation to people targeted by security lists worldwide, and has represented numerous individuals in delisting proceedings before the UN Office of the Ombudsperson. And his new book, The Law of the List, UN Counterterrorism Sanctions and the Politics of Global Security Law um, by Cambridge University Press in 2020, provides a detailed and critical analysis of the UN Security Council's ISIL and Al-Qaeda listing regime and the UN Office of the Ombudsperson. And last but not least, Dr. Devika Havel. Dr. Havel is an associate professor in public international law at the London School of Economics. And before that, she served as an associate to Justice Kenneth Hayne at the High Court of Australia 
and as judicial clerk at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Dr. Havel's research interests are in the areas of the use of force, international criminal law, and UN Security Council decision-making. And she's the author of various publications, including the book, The Power of Process, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2016, which examines in detail the contribution of the Office of the Ombudsperson to due process and sanctions decision-making. Now, I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for being with us. And as agreed, and for ease of communication, we will use a first names for the remainder of this webinar. Now, about the structure of this event, I will pose a number of questions to the panelists. And after that, we will have some time for a Q&A with you, the people watching at home. So please send in your questions via the chat function, which you will be able to find in the bar below. And also please specify to whom you are directing the questions. Now, let's first look at the creation of the office back in 2009. And let's start with some questions to Kimberly. So Kimberly, what made late 2009 a, yeah, a window of opportunity in which the Security Council was open to creating such an office, especially given the critical element inherent to the role of ombudsperson? knew I'd do that. I think it's best described as a perfect storm of conditions that uh, came together in that period. And there were several, but I'll touch on, on some of the critical ones. First, really importantly, there was already in place a real base or plan for action in, in relation to the problems with the regime. This was not something that happened overnight in 2009. For eight years, there had been pressure ever since the creation of the regime, there had been pressure, there had been criticism, there had been activism from academics, NGOs, states, and a number of important reports were generated over that time period that were then in place when uh, other factors came into play. And really importantly, amongst the pressure, you had something that you rarely have, which is support from inside. Secretary General Kofi Annan and his uh, legal advisor, Nicolas Michel, had a real commitment and a real fierce belief in need for reform in this area. And they promoted it internally within the, and externally. And in fact, they ultimately created the paper that set out the principles upon which the ombudsperson was created. And you also had within this pressure uh, built up um, a group of states that came together, the group of like-minded states. And they were an, an impressively organized group, there still are to this day, that then marshaled forward um, again when, when other factors uh, came into play. So that's, that, that pressure base was there. Secondly, very importantly, you had a functional security council. Uh, not as, uh, not as um, dreamy as in the 1990s when we saw extraordinary steps, but it was still pretty good. You could get consensus, you could get agreement unlike the situation today where this would be impossible. So that was critically important. And then thirdly, the bomb went off in Luxembourg in September, 2008 with the Caddy decision in the European Court of Justice effectively striking down the implementing legislation for sanctions and all those factors came together to create a pressure that couldn't be resisted. And we had the ombudsperson. Thank you. Um, now you were appointed to serve as the first ombudsperson beginning in um, 2010. Eh? And until you started in this role, there was very little overlap between the UN's counterterrorism sanctions and human rights. Um, could you briefly explain how you started to develop your office? Well, this was the problem and this was the challenge because I really didn't have a model. Uh, you know, I, I suppose essentially I didn't really quite know what I was going to do. Um, I had the benefit though, it's a real credit to the Security Council, especially at the working level, the actual process they outlined in the annex to the resolution, which is fundamental to this day, was a pretty good process. And they had in fact accepted all of the points that Kofi Annan had, had outlined to the Security Council previously. But what was missing when you looked at it, it was drafted by diplomats and it was thinking about political processes and political solutions. So it was really devoid of the kind of legal concepts and, and, and standards you would expect. So my first, 
I, I decided the first action had to be infusing it with those legal concepts. So that's why I pursued some of my first policies, which were what's the standard of review? What's the nature of the review? Uh, that was how one, one thing I thought was very important. And secondly, to quickly develop policies and procedures which would ensure that the practice of the ombudsperson was standard, consistent and predictable because that was so important to give it credibility. It's not just an ad hoc looking at the facts in a case, it's applying facts to a standard. And I think that was um, the second thing that, that I uh, prioritized. And finally, there were lots of gaps in terms of fair process in this procedure. And so every opportunity I had, I pushed the envelope as far as I could for fair process. Uh, the Russians told me several times I was obsessed with fair process, which I quite acknowledged. <laughs> okay, and and yeah, you already touched upon this, but in what ways did your early involvement allow you to shape the way uh, the ombudsperson mechanism works? Well, early was the key word because um, I was very excited about the job, even though I was slightly terrified. But I um, I landed in New York even before I had a contract, and I was showing up on people's doorsteps, you know, asking questions and wanting to get started. And I, I really decided to, to move as quickly as I could in developing the implementation road and the, and the policies and the procedures. And resting on the independence of the office, I never even considered uh, a diplomatic approach. It's not my strong suit anyway. And so I really, I'm, I made no attempt to get any consensus or support for what I was going to do. I just sort of, I consulted key stakeholders, if I could put it that way, discreetly on what the legal limits might be, what other limits might be politically. And then I just formulated the policies and adopted them. And uh, I know it was risky because uh, I was taking the calculated risk that there wouldn't be a pushback from the, the council. But I'm told by some of the people who were working in capitals at the time that they were just all flabbergasted that I had approached it this way. And so I never really did get any pushback. And I think that was important. And secondly, what was really important and critical, I had two cases when I arrived. And so I was able to test out very quickly the whole procedure and identify where the, where the big faults were. And there was the obvious gap, the problem that one state could block the, well, it wasn't called a recommendation, but the observations of the ombudsperson at the time. And so um, I made it clear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna identify this in my reports and I'm not gonna back away from the fact that the process isn't fair because of that problem. And that I think it wasn't the only factor, but it certainly contributed then to the renewal, which introduced the famous uh, reverse uh, consensus provision that has been at the heart of the fairness of the ombudsperson process. So I think, uh, I think that was sort of the, the things that's, that strike me the most about that period. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, let's proceed to the first 10 years of the office involving the others as well. Um, I would like to ask the current and former ombudspersons to talk about the biggest challenges you face. So with an eye toward revealing whether the challenges have remained the same or if they have changed as the office has grown more established. And maybe we can start with you, Kimberly, and then move to Katrin and Daniel. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a mix of both, things that remain the same and things that were different. Uh, I think for me, one of the biggest challenges was just from the fact that everything was new. Um, first of all, for 18 months, I didn't, I didn't have anybody with me. So it was just me. It was me you know, doing all the things with part-time uh, support and help from, from DPA, but uh, that was really difficult. And I had to literally be very creative in bringing in you know, graduate people, master's students from Columbia uh, to help me out. Um, and so that was, that was a huge challenge. Um, and secondly, everything was new. And quite frankly, I don't think even the P5 really understood what they had done. <laughs> so I had to keep explaining the fundamentals of, of rule of law because for them, nothing much had changed and, and this process was a big change. So um, that, was, that was a challenging atmosphere to work in. A uh, couple of things, I'll, I won't speak in detail to them because I'm sure Catherine and Daniel will speak about them uh, that have remained constant access to confidential information, building the, the ability to do that and then how to use it in a fair way and transparency, trying to build those reasons and get them to put some transparency into the process. Those are huge challenges. And lastly, I never speak to this without mentioning it, 
Sadly, one of the biggest challenges, the relationship with the United Nations Secretariat. I started off with a fantastic group that had been there during the crisis and understood the role, but as people changed, uh, the attitude changed dramatically. And I really believe we reached a point where there was no understanding, interest and support for the ombudsperson role. And, and, and what remains a problem to this day is as a result, they did not fully implement an office of the ombudsperson, an independent office. And that was one of my big, uh, big challenges. I'll stop there. Everyone's heard enough from me. <laughs> Thank you. Catherine? Yes, was busy uh, unmuting. Um, so same question, what, what, what uh, challenges have been overcome or, yes. or remain, right? Um, well, probably uh, the the big challenge for me was uh, was keeping the, the keeping up the the good work and the standard that Kim had, had put in place. Uh, she had been extremely busy with a, a large amount. I can't remember now how many cases uh, were uh, actually reviewed before my arrival. But something like sixty or something like that. It was huge. So the main challenge for me was actually. Uh, uh, making sure that I would uh, capture um, the approach of my predecessor that would really be able to, I mean, if I was to ever depart from it, at least doing it consciously as opposed to by lack of knowledge of what, what was the approach. And after having done that in the very early days, uh, months of my arrival, I thought that it would be a good idea to maybe use that work that had been done of course, with some reductions, to make it available uh, to future petitioners, lawyers assisting them, and the general public. And in fact, was a little bit of a, I mean, I wasn't sure they would fly. I mean, we, I remember we had discussion, Kim, and uh, you were of the view that maybe uh, that wouldn't fly. But I thought that, okay, let's try to be transparent, since I was seeking more transparency for the system. So be transparent with the committee and let them know why, what I intended to do and why. And it actually uh, was, was fine. We were able to do that. Um, so I think that was an improvement really in terms of transparency, of course, uh, when you are in a, in, a, in a system where petitioners themselves have no access to the entire report issued in their case, you can imagine for a new petitioner uh, or even a lawyer, I mean, not really knowing how these uh, these standards are applied, uh, it's a big challenge. So that I think was a, a challenge that worked well. Uh, another challenge, which I think still remains, but there was some improvement, was in my view the the possibility of giving petitioner in their own case substantive reasons. Um, in a way, I I had a setback compared to the situation that Kim had because toward the end of a uh, of your term, Kim, you were able to provide reason letter that were actually capturing relatively well the, your reasoning in the, in the cases. And I had the same at the beginning, but at some stage, uh, I was asked more and more to cut. So for so those who are not very familiar with the system, you issue a report as ombudsperson, it goes to the committee. And if the committee is following your, your recommendation, I mean, you're asked as an, om an ombudsperson to prepare summary of the reason but you you were at the time i was given very strict limits uh, it had nothing to do with the importance of the case the complexity of it in a way i would be given the same amount of uh, space to give reason uh, whether it was about one conduct from one go or whether it was a conduct spanning over uh, years it was alleged with multiple incidents so uh, we managed to get a change, uh, the adoption in the annex to the resolution, uh, get an article 16, which is now at least articulating the, the basis on which the committee shall exercise its review of those reasons. And it, it is related to uh, security reasons. So if by inadvertence the ombudsperson has disclosed something that shouldn't be disclosed in, in, in the letter, uh, gives the committee an opportunity. And it's clear from this uh, annex now, the ombudsperson shall address all, each of the arguments made by the petitioner. So that gives you, as you can imagine, that buys you in more space for doing that. And at the same time, if um, the case is not a case of uh, retention, but at least, in, at least you need to capture 
the main aspect of the reason. So those are two challenges. It's not ideal. I mean, the ideal would be to be able to have a, a, the totality of the report, maybe with some reductions uh, made public and at least shared with the petitioner, but we're not yet there. I'm sure that, I mean, there were other challenges, but I'm sure that uh, Daniel will be, they, they still continue if I understand correctly. So maybe it's better for, for uh, Daniel to speak of it. Merci beaucoup. An excellent bridge indeed to Daniel. So Daniel, can I give you the floor? Uh, for, mm -hmm. First of all, I'm very grateful for the work done by uh, Kim and Catherine. It's a really strong basis for continuing here. Um, most surprising for me when I took office coming from outside to United Nations from a national court was uh, that member states are acting more as political bodies than as participants or parties in a traditional proceeding. The proceedings are places where often political statements are made. That was really surprising for me. Uh, most difficult to establish uh, a real dialogue with member states, with the responsible persons in the capitals. Uh, while talking to representatives in the committee, I do often not know whether my questions, my reasoning really arrive at the point of destination. So it's uh, <clears throat> difficult to establish uh, an atmosphere, a culture of, of dialogue and of, uh, yes, of that's uh, second, the second issue in this context, and I think related to the first one, is uh, that's normally very difficult to receive answers at all from member states after reaching out to them. And it's often especially difficult to get reliable information relevant to the case. So that's uh, maybe the most important issues. The question with the, with the reasons letter seems to be resolved today so far. That's my impression. But I can confirm what uh, Kim mentioned that uh, the problem of uh, how to use uh, confidential information. That's uh, on the perspective of uh, rule of law and fairness, the most, the most difficult aspect of the of the proceeding. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, let's bring in some more external perspectives. Uh, anyone on the sanctions list may send a delisting request to the ombudsperson. And a lawyer is not needed, but since 2019, the office keeps a list of lawyers willing to provide pro bono services and connects them with petitioners uh, who ask for <coughs> pro bono legal assistance. Daniel, if I may ask you, how does this process differ from representing a client in a criminal law case? Eh? Can you speak? about the ways in which pro bono lawyers played out in your process, or does it affect your approach in a case? Uh, the ombudsperson's mechanism is not very formalized. It's not a very formalized procedure as it would be before a criminal court. Uh, there are not many formal rules. In criminal cases, the lawyer's work is much more about ensuring that the formal guarantees of the procedure are respected. And in the ombudsperson's cases, it's less, uh, the ombudsperson cases, it, it's less about uh, legal representation focused on rules than uh, informal support of the petitioners by a professional. Uh, the ombudsperson procedure is much more about the credibility of a person in an overall assessment and less about the establishment of facts through legally bound procedures. That's an important difference. But the presence of a lawyer affects my approach in practical regard, of course, yes. The contacts to the petitioners, for example, are going through the lawyers. In substance, I'm a professional. I'm used to proceed independently, impartially, and, I, and to respect the basic rule of fairness. In so far, the presence of a lawyer does not change a lot but it is good also for the ombudsperson to have lawyers involved. It helps to be always to be always careful. And of course, a lawyer supports the petitioner, for example, by asking questions that the ombudsperson would not have thought of, or by submitting relevant information that would otherwise not have been included in the files. 
The presence of a lawyer makes my function clearer. That's my impression, especially the ombudsperson impartiality for the committee. And I'm sure that the presence of a lawyer during the whole proceeding supports the appearance and the credibility of the mechanism for the public. And it strengthens the petitioner's trust in the procedure and his understanding of what is going on. Everything very positive for me. So, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, now let's move to our external experts. So first to Gavin. Um, can you touch on two things? So first, how you got involved. And second, what your experience has been as counsel for a petitioner. So how, as far as you can tell, of course, have your clients felt about the experience? Yeah, thanks, Christoph. Um, <clears throat> look, I, I first became involved here as a human rights lawyer. I was working uh, here in the UK um, in constitutional and administrative law. I worked, I moved to Germany. I, I worked with a human rights NGO in Berlin. And while I was there in 2009, I wrote a report um, on the issue of uh, terrorism, blacklisting and, and fundamental rights. Um, and what that report really did, it kind of opened my eyes to just how radically the international legal order was shifting through this listing regime. It really is uh, an extraordinary legal instrument that was created and has been used. Um, and I, after that report circulated, I was contacted by a Tunisian migrant rights organization in France. Uh, who had been in contact with some Tunisian nationals who were uh, targeted on this list and were at a complete loss as to what they were going to do uh, in relation to getting off it. So as um, the Office of the Ombudsperson had just been created, I decided to take their cases on pro bono. Um, and I spent um, some time over the next few years working with legal volunteers, uh, putting those delisting cases together and representing them uh, as best we can. We put in four applications over four years, um, all of whom were, uh, came off the list. Um, and since then, I've had quite a number of other clients come forward, and I'm currently acting for three more uh, individuals uh, in the early stages of preparing the listing applications uh, for them as well, from Tunisia and also from uh, other countries like Yemen. So I just wanted to stress that that experience of working with listed uh, individuals really helped me see firsthand how unjust this system is for those who are targeted. Um, and, and I wanna stress how differently this listing regime looks like if you look at it from the perspective of the individuals who become enrolled and targeted on this listing regime. People, my clients I'm talking about, people are being targeted here on the basis of um, what appeared to be, in some cases, little or no grounds at all. Um, uh, Mr. Kipfer Pasciati talked about the difficulty of obtaining information from states, and that's certainly been the experience of some of my clients as well. We found that there was very little underneath the listing decisions, at least, that was being disclosed to us. When you're on this list, it's impossibly, it can be very difficult to rent a house. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to travel. Um, it disrupts your life in innumerable, um, innumerable ways. Your finances are either frozen, or in the case of my clients, they had a kind of direct, directly appointed officials from the treasury departments controlling the, how their finances were dispersed. Um, it's a criminal offense for anyone to give you any money. So it's extremely difficult to get by. Um, once you're listed as well, it opens up the door for individuals to be harassed and targeted by local security officials. So. Um, my clients, for example, were targeted in, were listed in Italy, and there you could do a small amount of work. But all of my clients were routinely harassed by the security services. Intelligence officials came to their workplace and said, you know, do you know you're employing a terrorist, et cetera, et cetera. And that made their everyday living extremely difficult. They were all offered inducements to come off the list if they cooperated with the security services in their countries as well, which also highlights a problem which um, has been reported by others who are targeted on that list if they act as informants. And the, the key issue for me came when the WikiLeaks documents came out. Um, and there I was able to find at least quite a bit of information about my clients' cases. And I saw, I found out firstly, the state who listed them, in this case, was the United States. But secondly, that the US had undertaken a review of my client's cases five years before, and had found that there was actually no insufficient grounds to retain them 
on the security list. So that was five years before I'd picked up the case as well. Um, and yet, and so at the point I wanted to make there is, um, here they were many years later, effectively um, preventatively targeted by this list. And they probably would have stayed that way forever if it wasn't for pro bono lawyers actually acting on their behalf to put forward their case for, for delisting. So just as my clients felt about this process, I, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, they've generally felt about the ombudsperson procedure, a combination of relief, confusion, and anger. Relief because they've finally come off the list. And I think I'm personally as a lawyer and individually, all of my clients have been extremely grateful for the work that uh, the, the ombudsperson office holders themselves have done in order to facilitate that process. Confusion, because my clients have come off the list without a clear understanding in many cases of why they were on the list in the first place. And I think that that speaks to some of the issues around transparency and the question of reasoned decision-making that have been raised. And then what that gives rise to, the third phase for listed individuals is anger. Anger that their lives and the lives of their families have been targeted in this way for many years without meaningful accountability or reasoned decision-making to justify why they've been targeted. So, you know, so it's a mixture. And, and, and I just wanted to put that out there at the beginning that when, when you look at it from the perspective of the listed individuals, um, we're of course very supportive of the office of the ombudsperson. I have used the procedure on numerous occasions, but there are still structural flaws with the office that I hope we have the chance to discuss throughout the conversation today. Very clear, uh, thank you. And thanks again for your flexibility of stepping in at such uh, short notice. Um, finally, a question to Devika, who is joining by the way from Australia. So also many thanks for your flexibility. Um, as we know, the Office of the Ombudsperson also faced opposition uh, uh, in its first 10 years. Can you elaborate a bit on this? Yeah, well, in terms of opposition, I suppose it's a good sign the Ombudsperson is doing his or her job as a neutral arbiter if they're receiving flack from both sides, um, as it were. But in terms of opposition, it's perhaps more accurate to talk about the opposition to the sanctioned regime more generally on the basis of due process concerns that we've heard about from Gavin, uh, rather than opposition directed at the Ombudsperson, his or herself. Um, I recall being at a meeting of the American Society of International Law where Hans Carell made the surprising admission that at the time of the shift to targeted sanctions, his offer to provide legal advice in his capacity as the UN Legal Council was actually rebuffed by the, count, by the Security Council on the basis that there were no legal issues involved in the listing or delisting of individuals. And as we've certainly heard, that proved not to be the case. Uh, and that was further evidenced by cases such as Cardi, um, Aldalimi, Nada in the European Court of Human Rights, Ahmed and Youssef in the UK, Al Gabra and so on. Um, indeed, according to the latest information I've found, there've been about 31 proceedings uh, in regional domestic courts um, and the Human Rights Committee. Um, according to the latest information in the 2019 report of the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team, there's also litigation pending in four cases in courts in the UK and Pakistan. So this dialogue, if I could use that word, between domestic courts and the council, though, I think has been fruitful. Um, and that's to the extent it can be said that the council has listened. If exercised responsibly, domestic and regional courts have a unique capacity to shift the council on the question of due process protections. Because dangerously, if they declare relevant legislation enacting sanctions invalid, they've got the capacity to open holes in the sanctions net. So the council therefore has an impetus to prevent this by introducing measures deemed necessary. So Kimberly has spoken about the bomb of the Cardi litigation uh, that we have heard can claim a fairly major role in actually prompting the establishment of the, of the Ombudsperson Office itself. Thank you, Devika. Um, moving the discussion uh, away now from the more practical day-to-day -day business, uh, we are talking about an office that serves as a quasi-adjudicative entity. Uh, so in many ways, the post has judicial characteristics. And indeed, as we have heard in the introductions, uh, each ombudsperson has a judicial background. However, uh, petitioners before the office of the ombudsperson do not have access to full judicial review. 
So proceedings, which are all politically sensitive, are conducted behind closed doors. Um, the Ombudsperson has no mandate to review the committee's decision to list the petitioner, only to examine the situation at the time that the application for delisting is made. And the Ombudsperson recommendations are precisely that, they're recommendations and not decisions. Um, with regard to transparency, it was already mentioned, uh, only in the case of a delisting is the name of the petitioner published and to identify to the relevant authorities that he or she is no longer subject to sanctions. Uh, but in retention cases, names are not revealed and details about all proceedings remain confidential. Uh, finally, the Office of the Ombudsperson operates in the counterterrorism arena, an environment known for its tense uh, politics and high profile examples of due process and human rights issues. And this unique mix of features uh, that make up the office of the ombudsperson, in addition to the highly politicized environment in which the office operates, suggests the necessary development of a unique jurisprudence or legal philosophy uh, by which the office and the ombudsperson operate. Now, starting with two questions to you, Daniel, as the current ombudsperson. So first, what makes your approach to cases different from that of a judge in a court? And second, uh, the Security Council specifically asked that you assist the committee and that you work independently and don't seek or receive advice from governments. How realistic and sustainable is that in a highly political environment? Uh, to your first question, in short, uh, very important. I do not have a subpoena power no coercive power. The ombudsperson has to clarify the question whether the alleged facts are established like a judge has to do, but the ombudsperson does not have the means at the disposal of a judge to do so. The ombudsperson is depending on the goodwill of designating and relevant states in this regard. That's uh, the most important difference. And second, about independence, for me, it's not a problem if member states express their opinion on a case that is their prerogative. In my turn of office, up till now, the independence of the ombudsperson has been respected by member states. As long as there are no attempts of interference, I'm okay with as long as the communication of an opinion by a member state is, for example, not linked with threats of consequences. If I couldn't work independently and without interference by third parties or member states, I would leave the post immediately. In my practical word, on the single case, I'm independent, free from any attempts of interference, but institutionally, as I have mentioned different times, and my predecessors did as well, the ombudsperson and the ombudsperson's office are not independent. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, maybe a follow-up question. Would listed individuals and entities and UN itself uh, be best served by a truly judicial review? Yeah? So one that gives the ombudsperson the authority to overturn committee decisions. The established mechanism is effective. As you have heard, more than 70% of the listing petitions are successful. So for listed individuals and entities, it's maybe not the most important step as long as they are satisfied that the sanction is reviewed at the time of the petition and not ab initio. Or in other words, if they do not ask and do not have a reason to ask to review the committee's initial listing decision, but uh, for United Nations itself, it would be best served. United Nations would be best served, of course, by a truly judicial review. That would be a legally very important step, especially regarding acceptance of the mechanism by national and regional, especially European courts. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, maybe you can chime in as well, Catherine and Kimberly. Maybe you first, Catherine. Uh, or, or you, if you, I'm happy to yeah to say a word there. I think I, I agree that the, the system is quite effective because I mean yes we don't have um, subpoena power, but on the other hand, if states refuse to share the basis for which they want the listing to remain. Ombudsperson can just 
for conclusion that there is no sufficient basis for maintaining the, the listing. And in the cases which, uh, which uh, I felt which were really litigious, uh, on a few occasions, that's what happened. Uh, I mean, it happened uh, on occasion that I was able to identify from other states sufficient reason or from independent research, but in a number of cases, the outcome was well recommendation to do this because I, I don't have a crystal ball. If the states refuse to share, they, they tell us that they have good reasons to maintain the listing, uh, but if they don't share them, we're not bound to, to accept that, right? So, yeah, I, I think that uh, a judicial process, of course, would have uh, additional uh, additional strength, but in this specific area of sanctions, uh, I think it would, it would be already good if other regimes were able to benefit from the, the type of review that the ombudsperson is, is giving. Thank you. Kimberly? I agree with uh, much of what's already been said by, by my colleagues, but um, I think my answer is simple is in a perfect world, maybe it would be a, a step forward and it would be a benefit, uh, but we're not in a perfect world. And I believe um, it's the best model because it's realistic and workable. Judicial review of the Security Council decision is simply, it certainly wasn't gonna happen then, and it's not gonna happen now when rule of law is a bad term to use and the Security Council is fundamentally dysfunctional. So uh, for me, what was most important, the most we can hope for is something that in practice can give a fair process. And I think it's still got issues that can be pushed and, and we've talked about some of them, but I still think fundamentally uh, and dependent, I think, on, on the work that the individuals do in the post, but I think fundamentally it delivers a fair process and it delivers a remedy. And I think that 70% that have come off the list uh, at least would be more grateful to have had the mechanism that works than to wait for a day when we could get what I think remains quite unrealistic to achieve. And I also would say there are some real benefits to not using the classic judicial review. And that is in particular, uh, because it's a, a test of de novo at the time, people who were involved, and I had several who said quite openly they were involved with Al Qaeda, but they changed, would be stuck with the with the classic judicial review on the reasonableness of the original decision. So I think it's functional in that respect. And I also think, I agree with Catherine, that the, the hammer of the reverse consensus means that there is a will to cooperate and they have to cooperate. And also, it's amazing what you can find without the states cooperating. I mean, the, the, the open information was astonishing in some cases. So uh, for me, you know, we've got to keep working on it. I agree on extension, absolutely. But um, I, I don't think we'll, we'll get JR, and I don't necessarily think we need it. Very clear. Thank you. Um, any thoughts on this point, Gavin and Devika? So what do you think about the fact that the ombudsperson procedures are strictly confidential and that they remain so after the case is closed? On Given? Mute, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, just on the confidentiality point, I mean, I think the use of closed material, the confidentiality of the proceedings is critically important here. It remains uh, one of the core tensions underneath the listing regime. And I think the Ombudsperson Office has done um, a very innovative job uh, working within the parameters of what they're working in to kind of push the boundaries there. But it still remains to be a real uh, problem. And I, I think, you know, we're all familiar with the core problem here. How can someone properly defend themselves from an allegation if that they're associated with terrorism, if you don't know what that allegation is? You know, this is the kind of why this regime has been likened to a kind of Kafkaesque dilemma. And I've experienced that process at first hand on numerous occasions in relation to, to, to my individuals uh, that I've represented. So to give you a kind of practical example, I, I've, I've, I've worked on a case, for example, where we've spent months, even years, preparing the case for delisting. And then on the day of the dialogue meeting, we've been given a kind of allegation, an intelligence report that just says, your client, Mr. X, recently met with a, an extremist, a Tunisian extremist. Please explain. And of course, you know, the normal lawyer response would be, so who is the extremist, what's the nature of the allegation, in what circumstances did this allegation arise? And of course, there's nothing 
further than that. You're just left with, in some cases, the allegation. And for, for individuals themselves, you're then left with a, you put in a fairly invidious situation for the lawyers. Do you encourage your client to answer the allegation Salem witch trial style and kind of name people who they may have met over the course of the period. What are the possible consequences of that? Well, in Tunisia, if you started throwing around the names of people potentially associated with terrorism, then they may well suffer adverse consequences as a result. They may find themselves subject to travel restrictions, put onto uh, an extremist database, the S-17 database, which they have in Tunisia, et cetera, et cetera, harassment from the security services. If you don't, uh, will adverse inferences be drawn as they would in a criminal procedure? Now, um, to the credit of the Office of the Ombudsperson, we found a pragmatic workaround to that situation, uh, which worked to the advantage of our client. But it gives you a sense of the kind of dilemmas that individuals are faced with when in relation to closed material procedures. And this is effectively a closed material procedure. Now, um, in other areas of secret justice, like the SIAC, the Special Immigration Appeals Commission in the UK, for example, we have special advocates at least who can see the material, make representations against the material. I don't think that is a fantastic model, but it certainly, um, uh, it is to be contrasted with the ombudsperson procedure because here we don't actually have access to the material. I think the ombudsperson does a reasonable job of trying to put the inferences to the targeted individual, but answering inferences without sight of the material is an extremely difficult process. I just wanted to, to stress that. Um, now, in terms of the reports not being given to listed individuals, I, I, to my mind, this, is, this has to change. I mean, you know, at the end of the procedure, there has to be provision of the comprehensive report to people who are being targeted so they can get a sense of why they have been put on the list or in some cases, why they've remained on the list. This is, you know, understanding decision making, making decision making uh, provide, decision makers provide reasons is a fundamental element of due process, which really the Security Council needs to get around in, in, in that respect. Um, and, 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 you know, on the question of independence, again, I just wanted to say, I, I've, I've got immeasurable respect for all of the office holders of the, of the, of the office of the ombudsperson, you're all senior jurists respected in your field. I don't think we're questioning the independence of you qua individuals, but the independence of the institution of the office of the ombudsperson vis-a-vis -vis the Security Council uh, with respect to, you know, whether or not a recommendation is sufficient to justify due process demands of an individual who's targeted, that, that's a core issue which still needs to be addressed, even with the reverse consensus procedure. Now, on the question of whether or not judicial review is better, um, and I know that this is a huge debate. Um, look, from the perspective of individuals who are targeted, to take that perspective, yes, it's a clear yes. I mean, I've worked as a judicial review lawyer in the High Court of England and in the delisting procedures of the ombudsperson, and I can tell you that in terms of the process benefits of, a, of an individual, in that space, they're immeasurably better. Is there political appetite in the UN Security Council for affording that kind of judicial review? Um, no. Um, and I think we saw that in the response to Ben Emerson's uh, 2012 report as the UN Special Rapporteur, where he effectively recommended that the office of the Ombudsperson be transformed into an independent adjudicator with decision-making powers. And the response to that was discarded. Could we have a, a world court for human rights? This was Martin Scheinan's idea of a way around this problem. Um, and, and of course, there are plenty who are pushing for that uh, in that direction where we have a kind of global constitutionalist response to the problem of, of targeted sanctions. Um, and there are many who say that that's not possible. So what are we left with? Well, we have a global administrative law approach, which is the office of the ombudsperson with limits about what it can do procedurally. And I think the limits are starting to play out in the discussion we've had to date. And we've got pluralist review by national and regional courts, like we saw in Cardi, periodically punching holes in the Security Council's listing regime and pushing it to go further. Thank you. Devika, would you like to follow up? Yes, I, I'd just like to chime in on this debate that's been set up between judicial review and the ombudsperson, it has been phrased in terms potentially of, of an international or a sanctions court 
versus the ombudsperson. Whereas what we actually have, as Gavin has, has, has um, raised as well, but what we actually have is, is this middle ground of domestic courts seeking to be the judicial review organ. And so just to tie that in with our confidentiality concerns, uh, as many of us are aware in, in that final Cardi case, we had the Court of Justice of the European Communities set itself up as the judicial review engine and uh, say essentially that um, the EU had to ensure any listing was taken on a sufficiently solid factual basis and the secrecy or confidentiality of information or evidence is no valid objection before EU courts. So that contrast between the ombudsperson on the one hand or a domestic or regional court reviewing, I think we come out clearly then surely in favour of the ombudsperson, simply because the idea that any listing state is going to provide intelligence to a foreign regional or domestic court is highly unlikely. And so Kimberly's talking, spoken about the practical issues here. What I'm struck by is really the advantages of the ombudsperson um, in terms of finding that terribly difficult balance between the justifiable concerns regarding confidentiality of intelligence and due process. Uh, so what I will say is that I think the ombudsperson is far better placed than domestic courts to achieve that balance uh, for, for a variety of reasons and I'll very briefly mention four. First is as we've heard these cases are more likely to involve intelligence than evidence uh, and, and I think it was Kimberly that acknowledged in one of her reports the importance of experience and institutional memory developed across the complex matrix of sanctions cases that enables the ombudsperson to assess key questions and issues that arise in determining justifications. Secondly, the office has that unique access to pressure points to persuade states to do so, that reverse consensus, not to mention a Chapter 7 Security Council resolution mandate. Um, Thirdly, the ombudsperson can build up trust with states, which a domestic or regional court isn't in position to do. Uh, we, we might be aware that the ombudsperson has entered into 20 agreements or arrangements for access to classified information, including with some of the states most often involved in listing decisions. And fourth is that capacity, and this is more foreign to common lawyers, that the ombudsperson really acts as an investigator um, as well as a judge and therefore has that capacity um, to, to act as that independent arbiter of the information um, in that setting. Thanks. Thanks, Devika. Um, to Daniel, Catherine and Kimberly, I would like to ask what unique jurisprudence or legal philosophy that you feel you created or worked with that you would like to mention here and why? So maybe Daniel can go first. Uh, yes, uh, here I would like to let uh, my predecessors speak first and uh, to give on the general answer. Unique is the jurisprudence because it had and has to be created based on legal principles, fairness, independence, impartiality, the right of, uh, to be heard in a political context and environment and together with politically thinking stakeholders. Okay. Thank you. Katrin? Maybe there are a few, but maybe I'll raise the one that Kim touched upon at some stage, the criteria for disassociation. I mean, with this review, you're either in front of someone who's saying, well, I shouldn't have been listed in the first place. There is no ground for my listing. Okay, that is something that you entertain on the basis of, is there sufficient um, information to constitute a reasonable basis to maintain the listing? But you, also, you also have those situations where someone has been associated with Al-Qaeda or ISIL. Sometimes I've as if even been uh, convicted for, uh, for crimes related to this association. And the person is in a situation where, how can I get off this list at some stage? If I actually uh, have done work on myself, if I've actually decided to, how can I prove that it, I am now disassociated? And that's something which is, I mean, it seems simple. It's actually quite a complex process, particularly when people are detained, uh, when they go through various um, 
programs uh, with, with people in the detention center, etc. And what I tried to do with some of the cases, and, and you can see it in the in the, uh, the part of the uh, website where we actually share those approaches, I've tried to give a, a bit of a, a clear understanding to persons listed that if they are in a position to uh, con concede that they were associated and want to demonstrate in good faith that they have now moved moved on, there are certain amount of signs that uh, can be considered to be sufficiently tangible for the ombudsperson person to take that into consideration and to um, so. I mean, it's uh, it's more complicated when you're detained, but yet. There are still things that can uh, occur, but here I would say two things can make that possible uh, without talking about the criteria themselves. I mean, it's important for that kind of assessment that the ombudsperson can actually get access to the petitioner and on a few limited but highly problematic cases, and I had one in particular, I wasn't let uh, the opportunity of discussing in person, certainly not, but not even uh, via other means than a meeting in person. And what do you do there? I mean, how can you assess whether someone might have had, uh, there might have been good reason for that person to be listed uh, 10 years ago. Is that the same person? Particularly when the states would not provide um, additional information about what makes them believe that the person is still uh, associated. I think that's really problematic. And the second, the second reason why it may the, the lack of transparency may be highly problematic in this area. This is if you if you want to give uh, the detention authority some some guidance in a way as to what are the signs that the, the ombudsperson can take into consideration. Well, if you can't make your report public or share it with those authorities, it's like a, a dialogue of the deaf, right? So it's really uh, some some area where I think there is still some improvement possible, but uh, try to do my best. Merci. Uh, Kimberly? Two things. Um, I am very pleased with myself over the standard I made up, because I made it up. And, um, uh, you know, I, I draw, I drew from the different legal systems, but it, it was, you don't get a chance to make up standards often. And I think it's been a very workable standard. I'm grateful to my, um, my successors that it's been maintained. And I think it balanced the, the various factors and used words and language that cut across all systems, you know, sufficient information to provide a reasonable and credible basis for the listing. So that I, I think was, um, was one of the things I remember and uh, I think worked well. And secondly, um, not universally popular, and Ben Emerson certainly didn't like it, uh, but the policy I adopted on uh, how to deal with torture and how to deal with the allegations that the information underpinning the listing uh, came from torture. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a public policy, it's on the website, but I think it's not, um, it's not traditional, but I think it balances properly the principles related to torture, but at the same time, recognizes the practical nature and limitations of the ombudsperson process. So those are the two things that um, I remember, uh, I think most in terms of development of standards. Thank you. Um, and then finally, again to Daniel, Katrina and Kimberly, um, what did you find to be the biggest issues when operating in such a politicized environment? Maybe we can start with Daniel. As I said before, uh, to get uh, re reliable, necessary, reliable information relevant to the case, that's uh, uh, a big issue and it's uh, still a big issue. But maybe bigger for me in general is the problematic, is the problem to establish a rush, rational discourse with member states about legal principles in single cases and in general. And link to that, uh, the problem to convince member states and the secretariat that the institutional and contractual conditions have to be improved first and foremost by legal reasons. It would be a sign of strength if the council and the secretariat were able to realize this 
and actually a rather small, small problem after 10 years and three ombudspersons mentioning this issue. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I can certainly agree with what uh, Daniel has just said, that there is no doubt, but just to maybe to stress um, a different topic, I think on the issue of the independent, it, it touches upon it. There is this, um, at least from certain states, this kind of misunderstanding of what did it, does it mean for the ombudsperson to be independent, and this expectation that because the resolution speaks about the ombudsperson taking into account the views expressed by state, that would be, uh, that would mean that, I mean, you basically have to do what the states want, which obviously is not uh, <laughs> possible. Uh, I mean, I mean, if it's not, uh, if they're not providing sufficient reason to maintain a listing, there is no reason why the ombudsperson should, uh, should, should uh, follow that, that advice. But in my last report to the Security, to the Security Council, I, I actually tried to look a little bit in depth into, into what this actually means. And the reason why there is so much a misunderstanding is because the ombudsperson uh, uses the standard that Kim, uh, Kim established, but the states don't really seem to be using any standard, at least some states, <laughs> to put someone on the list. They don't necessarily uh, consider, for instance, that um, this association should grant uh, the possibility of uh, being removed from the list. They don't necessarily explain, want to explain why they believe that someone should remain on the list. So I think there is a lot of misunderstanding there and the, and, and the way it's addressed by states that are unhappy that uh, uh, with this uh, reverse consensus, uh, I mean, the ombudsperson person can have uh, his or her view prevailing, is to say that the, the, the ombudsperson person doesn't, uh, doesn't actually follow the, the rules of the game. But uh, I think the, the resolution in this respect is, is quite, uh, quite careful and well-balanced, I find. Let's see, um, Kimberly? Well, I think for me, um, it was the, the challenge was, and especially I suppose because I was at the beginning was you're in this highly political atmosphere to advance and safeguard and to push forward this office. I needed to engage on a political level. There was, you know, there was no choice. It's not like when I'm a judge and I can just say, and it's up to the states to deal with that. Um, so I had to push, I had to engage. And, you know, it wasn't easy. I would, I was called a terrorist sympathizer. I was told I was deconstructive, you know, and so I'd be having all these um, difficult uh, political discussions and trying to work through them. And yet at the same time, no matter how much I was prepared to do and engage when it came to the office itself and generally, when it came to the cases, you do exactly what a judge does, which is you can only determine and assess these cases based on facts versus the standard and nothing else can come into play. And you have to be very careful in this role to always be checking yourself in that respect. And, and it, it is, it's a fine line. So I think that that's something that's very important. Um, I agree also with all of the points that my, my uh, successors made about uh, other issues, but for me, that was um, a really important principle, and I know we have all uh, maintained it. And um, I think for whoever comes uh, after us, that is for me one of the most important things to remember. You engage because you have to for the office, but at the same time, you have to uh, be judicial in terms of how you approach each and every case and the fairness of the process. And and that's uh, that's quite a, a balance to run um, and to, and to carry out, but it's incredibly important. Thank you. Um, Gavin and Deepika, any final comments uh, on this issue? Yeah, just, I mean, to pick up on, on a couple of points, I mean, in terms of three bigger issues, and I've alluded to some of those uh, that I see throughout my contribution to date, but I would say how to take seriously the problem of using intelligence as evidence and to resolve that problem in a better way than it has been to date. And I mean, would include within that analysis how to deal with the use of torture evidence, even taking into account Kimberley's innovations in that area in terms of the guidance. My own view, and I think the view of Ben Emerson uh, being um, you know, the lawyer in the A and Others case here in the UK, the, lead, the leading case in that area really was, um, 
you know, how can we assess critically whether we're using torture material? And remember, we're dealing with global security, global terrorist, alleged global terrorist networks. So, and we're dealing with states where torture is still widespread. Many of the listing designations are targeting those in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, how do we deal with the problem of torture evidence if we can't actually look at the source of the material and interrogate the sources? If we can't actually have a judicial review function now the jurisprudence on this point in the uk and the SIAC uh, uh, tribunal is fairly clear uh, on, on that issue and and so i just kind of wanted to put out there that 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 is a real issue and i know from speaking to other lawyers who've engaged in this forum or chosen not to engage in this forum that the the question of how torture evidence is handled has been critically important um, secondly what about legal aid i mean i think we have to get serious about providing real resources to people who are targeted on the list here to provide um, proper legal representation here. Now, I haven't come up to speed yet on um, Mr. Kip Fafasiadi's new scheme, I, I must admit, but I have practiced in this area for a number of years without any resources whatsoever. And I can say already listed persons are starting at such an inequality of arms here. I've had to rely on armies of legal volunteers to translate material uh, and it's been extremely difficult to put pay, uh, cases together. We, we think of listed people often as Mr. Cardis in this environment, you know, people with large num amounts of resources who can hire international law firms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most of the people who I've dealt with have no resources or less than no resources. So they're not in a position to engage lawyers. And yet it makes a critical difference, we know, in terms of the outcome of the process. I mean, um, the current ombudsperson alluded to that before, and I know you've all noted that in the past. So this was a recommendation that, again, was made in Ben Emerson's report when he was special rapporteur. It was discarded promptly, I think, at the time. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it wasn't treated seriously. But I think the time is right to treat that seriously. The final issue that I think is critically important, and, and this is something I wanted to stress, is that um, we have a problem of secondary listing here. That is that states uh, put people on this list um, with very little scrutiny as to the grounds. Um, they then put those people on their own security lists and databases and their own sanctions regimes. When you come off the Security Council's list, you stay entangled in this web of other security lists and databases, I would say indefinitely. And to give you a practical example of that, I'm currently acting for four clients who I represented successfully in delisting proceedings with the ombudsperson, all of whom are unable to live a normal life today because they remain listed either in private risk management databases because they've been entangled up in the list, uh, on the US sanctions regime, which applies uh, extraterritorially um, to those, and it's practically impossible for non-US nationals to become delisted from that, from that sanctions regime. Now, I know that this isn't the fault of the ombudsperson, but I just wanted to put it out there that for those who are on the list, this is a life sentence. It lasts indefinitely. Um, and I don't know how that problem is to be dealt with, but it need, we need to get serious. And when we're talking about what's the difference between an ombudsperson review and a judicial review, my own feeling is that a judicial decision of sorts could go some way towards helping with that secondary listing effect, which, uh, which goes on to affect people's lives once they've become involved in that list. So yeah, there's three issues that I see that are critically important that ought to be addressed going forward. Thank you very much. Um, Devika? Yeah, returning to the politicization of the role, I think what we hear is that it is a legal role, but with a very political purpose, and that is to engender and promote trust in decision making, in the council's decision making. Um, and therefore emphasising the importance of the person holding the role, and this is getting very personal, when I was on a panel with Ben Emerson uh, debating the merits and demerits of the Ombudsperson Office, and I was speaking in favour of the office, uh, Ben Emerson said, you're not a fan of the Ombudsperson, you're a fan of Kimberly Prost. Kimberly Prost was then the Ombudsperson. Um, and he, he continued, unfortunately, we can't clone Kimberly Prost. And he was right in two respects. I am a fan of Kimberly Prost. And I'm also aware, because we've checked, that we can't clone Kimberly Prost. So, but the point being that it's we've been very fortunate to date in the individuals that have held this role, but it is crucial that the council continues to appoint 
individuals of seniority, integrity um, and expertise uh, for their own sake, because the trust in the individual, we've heard from Gavin, words like credibility, um, goodwill, I think Daniel referred to how important that had been. Um, this is about trust in essence and trust of the individual holding the office, but ultimately leading to trust uh, in the council's decision-making. Thank you. Um, let us now move to the concerns and hopes for the next decade. And already some points have been mentioned. So I'd like to ask each panelist to say in a few words, so really quite short, uh, on the biggest concern and their biggest hope also for the next uh, decade of the Office of the Ombudsperson. Maybe let's start with Kimberly, then Katrin, Gavin, uh, Divika, and then end with Daniel. Well, it leads well from what uh, Divika just said, because um, my concern is that uh, this creeping politicization in terms of the structure of the office and in terms of the selection process. And we saw that with the gap that we had between Catherine and, and Daniel. Uh, and, and my concern is that in this lack of rule of law atmosphere in the current climate, we must be vigilant to make sure we don't lose any ground. And we advance again and again that those changes that need to be made to ensure a good selection process and also to protect uh, the, the independence of the office in terms of its structure. And my, my big hope is that we are finally one day going to get this extended to the other sanction regime, something we've been talking about since the Ombudsperson office was open. Thank you. And Catherine? I'm not going to be very original. I think we were that close, actually, uh, to, to, to get exactly that, to, to get a, an institutionalization of the office. So uh, I'm, like my colleagues, very, very saddened that this didn't happen. But I, I really think it's just taking an extra push and, and this will happen. Um, while I don't believe that as was said earlier, that we are close to get any agreement for a judicial review. That one, the institutionalizing and the guarantees and you know what you just said about the, um, uh, the criteria for selecting the ombudsperson, that could be set in the, uh, in the framework institutionalizing the office. And I think that would do, go a long way in, uh, in securing the, uh, the system. Thank you. Gavin, you already mentioned a few points, but maybe also the hope for the future. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of um, challenges, um, well, I mean, you know, I've stated a number of challenges and concerns and, you know, I don't want to reiterate those um, now. Uh, I think before the Office of the Ombudsperson expands into other sanctions regimes, and I think there was a time when that might have been politically important, um, there are still structural issues with the office, which I think um, I would urge from representing listed persons need to be addressed effectively. You'll notice that the appetite for extending the office dissipated when the European Court of Decisions 2013 Cardi decision came out. And I think there is a kind of to and fro here between the Security Council's appetite to take action and effective litigation to push the um, to push the boundaries of what's possible here. So I think, in terms of uh, hope, I think there's going to have to be more strategic litigation brought against the regime to bring to bear and to challenge the legitimacy, the Security Council, the logis the legitimacy of the listing regime, uh, in order to push the Security Council uh, further in that regard. Um, my biggest hope is there were. You know, hundreds of people put on this list very quickly, sometimes with little to no consideration at all in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Many of those individuals still sit on the list today. Um, people in the, in the monitoring team have referred to them in the interview as low hanging fruit. And I, I wonder how many of those individuals who are remaining on the list are these low hanging fruit and how many individuals are, being, are still sitting there today because they haven't been able to effectively access legal counsel to, 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 to get off the list. So I don't know if it's politically impossible, but the idea of having an office of the ombudsperson that does a periodic review of the existing listings, irrespective of having individual counsel represented, to actually you know, review the list periodically to cull those cases and to remove those cases, I think would provide political advantages to states who don't want another Cardi case on the horizon. The Security Council would probably not like another Cardi case on the horizon and listed individuals would appreciate that as well. Um, so my biggest hope is in that direction, that we have a, a trimmed down list, um, but 
in the current environment, again, I'm I'm not confident that we're moving in that direction. Thank you, uh, Deepika. I'm waiting with bated breath to hear what Daniel has to say. So very quickly, my concern to attract the best possible people to the office, my hope to extend the ombudsperson mechanism to the other sanctions regimes. Thank you, nice and concise. Daniel? My main concern is that the position, the function could be compromised, weakened or undermined with the next resolution. Uh, and my biggest hope that this, this will not happen. So, and uh, concretely, two uh, aspects, uh, concrete points that we um, can make further steps on more transparency, uh, publication of comprehensive reports. That would be a small but important step. And the creation of a deputy for the ombudsperson that would give more uh, institutional nature to the function. Uh, a really positive hope is an improvement of institutional and legal independence will take place through the council and the secretariat by changing institutional and contractual conditions of, for the office and for the ombudsperson. That's it. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we now have some time for a Q&A with you and the people watching from home and uh, we have received many questions. So what follows is just the selection. Um, and the first question is to Daniel and Gavin. So what effect do you feel the office of the ombudsperson has had on the perceived legitimacy of the UN's counterterrorism mission? Would you like to start, Daniel? Mm, <clears throat> that's maybe a difficult question to answer for me to look from outside on. But it's clear the ombudsperson is part of the game. And uh, it's a, also a contribution to the leg legitimacy of uh, the counterterrorism sanctions re regime. And so it's uh, a problematic, uh, a problematic uh, function to legitimize uh, sanctions regimes, which are legally problematic in uh, uh, decision making. But uh, on the other hand, it is a help in every single case for individuals, listed individuals. So it's, it's both. It's a contribution to, uh, uh, to a perceived legitimacy of the, of the whole system. And it's help and uh, support in single cases. But maybe it's better to, to give an answer from outside. So we ask Gavin. <laughs> well, well I, th I think the, I mean, the legitimacy point is, is, is well taken. I think that, you know, when the ombudsperson was created, there were some academics um, who were very effusive about the office saying that, you know, the Security Council is becoming more enlightened, that we're now moving towards a human rights friendly Security Council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from those who I spoke to inside the Security Council diplomats and others uh, for my research, um, they weren't particularly interested in the human rights question at all. They were particularly interested in bolstering the legitimacy and use of their Chapter 7 targeting powers, which they all recognized was quite unique in this area. The, the, the Al-Qaeda list is a unique list. It targets individuals, not states, which is a real innovation as far as the Security Council and the UN Charter is concerned. And so, uh, of course, it targets groups as well. But, but, but the, those who I spoke with, were really about supporting, they were, they were interested in the long game of protecting the Security Council's governance in this new field. And to that extent, the Office of the Ombudsperson actually has been critical in providing legitimacy to that shift, um, which I think the Cardi case and the critique by the like-minded states really opened up and put into question for some time. Um, uh, have we seen the end of that critique? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, despite the innovations that the European Court of Justice have made in terms of changing their procedural rules to find to access classified material to try and resolve those problems, um, we haven't really seen a meaningful use of those innovations yet. Um, so I think we will see further cases and further crises pop up periodically. Um, will the Security Council have the appetite to resolve, uh, to be innovative again? I hope so. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
Um, to Devika and the others who wish to respond, um, the current ombudsperson is only related to ISIL and Al Qaeda. So, what about other sanctions regimes of the UN? Yes, as, as we've heard, it, it's only related to one sanctions regime, um, unlikely for the time being to be extended. Uh, other sanctions regimes uh, have something called the focal point. Uh, <laughs> With all due respect to the focal point, I have described it as a glorified post box. Uh, the focal point doesn't have a role in reviewing um, or investigating or, or, or any other um, activity. Um, and, and so this is why this hope on the part um, of many of us that, that um, the ombudsperson role is extended to these other sanctions regimes. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to add something or? Please do. Yeah, if I could just say briefly, yeah. this for me has been one of the biggest frustrations all these years because there is simply no logical justification, legal justification to not have this mechanism extended to all of the, the regimes. And I had a situation once where I had someone call me who was listed on one of the other regimes and I had to explain to the person that, you know, I couldn't deal with the case, not no authority. And he literally said to me, well, could you arrange to put me on, on the Al-Qaeda list because then you can maybe help me. So it just shows the complete absurdity of the situation. And it is all about politics. And I'm particularly interested though, to watch and see what the UK policy is on this because they've never been particularly strong on this. And now that they are not going to be governed by the European situation, will they take a stronger role in promoting the extension of the ombudsperson? We'll, we'll wait and see. Thank you. Um, to Daniel and uh, the former ombudsperson, so how do you handle cases where there is evidence that an individual has been involved with terrorism, but also evidence that that individual has legitimately left extremism behind? Uh, it's on me. Yes, please. Uh, sanctions are exclusively uh, preventative measures. So it's uh, balancing and uh, finally, to answer the question and only the question, if uh, a personalistic person still poses a threat to public, to the public, to safety and security of the public, and if not, there is no reason for uh, continuing a sanction. Catherine and Kimberly, would you like to add something to that? Maybe just quickly to to refer back to what we said earlier about the disassociation, that's what that's how we call this uh, particular scenario where the ombudsman considered that there was enough wrong, but there were reasons for the person to be listed, although not supposed to make that determination. You can read or you could read in our reports if you had access to them that often we were close to making that determination, but if there are enough uh, indicia of disassociation, then the system permits delisting and the number of delisting have been made on that basis, actually. Thank you. Kimberly, anything you would like to share? Sorry, no, I, I mean, I, I agree entirely with what's been said. I had a, a number of cases like that and, and the challenge is, is it a real change? Is it a real move um, away from extremism? And that you're, you're in basically into the realm of psychology in some circumstances, but it certainly is an important part of the work and, and it is certainly something that the ombudsperson has to tackle. Thank you. Um, maybe the last question also in view of the time to Devika and Daniel and or Daniel. So uh, where do you think future domestic legal challenges will come from? Uh, are they coming from outside the EU? And if so, what could this mean for Security Council dynamics? Perhaps we should give Daniel the last word, so I'll be quite brief. Um, the, the pending cases at the moment, there are three from Pakistan. Um, so it will be interesting to see. I think essentially the pressure comes with domestic cases where it will open a hole in the sanctions net. Uh, the reason the EU cases, I'd argue, were so powerful in uh, engineering change was because 
for the EU to stop enforcing the, or if to invalidate sanctions measures would open an EU size hole in the sanctions net. Uh, so it really uh, is, is a question as to whether um, a state in failing to enforce the sanctions measures if their domestic courts um, invalidate measures, uh, whether this is going to put pressure on the council. That, I think that's a significant political um, point in terms of the location um, from where these challenges come. Thank you. The final words to Daniel? Uh, final words. I have no further information about uh, existing uh, existence of uh, further challenges and from where they are coming. So uh, I have the same information as I said out before. But the uh, most important question will be if there are challenges regarding other sanctioned regimes. And uh, in this regard, I do not know, but I have heard that there are uh, petitions or cases on the way, but uh, I have no uh, specific information about that. Maybe someone other? No. Thank, yeah. thank you. No. Thank you very much for, uh, for these questions, also to you, to the audience, and for these elaborate answers. Um, I think this has been a very interesting evening and I would like to thank all the panelists for their insights, uh, the ICT and the Office of the Ombudsperson for their cooperation, the events and communications team at the Asser Institute for their excellent work in the background, as well as you and the audience for joining and for your questions. We could not address all of them, but feel free to send us an email and we'll try to follow up. And also, if you want to rewatch certain parts, this webinar has been recorded and will be placed on the Asser website and its YouTube channel. And finally, since you're, of course, all very interested in legal aspects of countering terrorism, I would like to mention that in two days, so on the 17th of June, the Asser Institute, again, in cooperation with the ICT, will launch the book Human Dignity and Human Security in Times of Terrorism, which I co-edited with Professor Martin Scheinen from EOI. He was already mentioned. He will also join our digital launch. And on Tuesday, the 23rd of June, ICT will host a live briefing on repatriation of foreign fighters and their families. So for more information, please have a look at the ASSO and ICT websites or better sign up to our mailing list. So thanks again to all of you. See you next time. So hopefully Wednesday and stay safe.